Welcome to another In Wheel Time podcast, a 30-minute mini version of the In Wheel Time car show that airs live every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central. Live from Studio A, it's the In Wheel Time car talk show. And coming up, Lena Bourgeois from Equifax, credit score impact on car insurance. Yeah, we hope to talk wow. to her about that. Because uh, I'm certainly interested. We all should be interested in that. Had no clue. Conrad is going to have the in-wheel time car clinic. I'll bring you this week's auto news. Howdy. Along with David Mm. Ainsley. Thank you, David. Mm. Thank you, David, so much for coming in. God bless you, my friend. Little Timmy. I came for Kalaji, so. Yeah, well, and you got Oh, that's why I got the emergency call at 4.30 this morning. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we have King Conrad along here with us and fresh back from vacation. And fresh the U- back. The UP of in, uh, Michigan. Is, call me fresh back. Is, <laughs> for UP. We always need more Jeff Zekin. I'm Don Armstrong. Thanks so much for joining us today. Youper. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Youper. <laughs> um, it was... Uh, it was a great time for us up there the week that David invited Leslie and I up there. Absolutely stunning and beautiful, and we had so much fun. Mm-hmm. So laid back. And just, what a history. Oh, my God, the history from you know the settlements, the Indians, all that, the different tribes that were up there. And my cousin Doug just sent me a note saying that there are more shipwrecks in the Great Lakes or Superior than there are in the Bermuda, Tri- Bermuda Triangle. I would so believe that. that that's, you know, well, you know, they, they, obviously there's a huge commerce part of vacationing up there because all of the iron ore and all of the rocks and all the stuff that they move across the lake they do that up until the lake freezes and they right. can't do it anymore did right. the edmund fitzgerald go down in superior yeah. superior it was on november 10th 1975 and that ship was actually built in 1958 yeah so it did have a, a bit of a longevity it, it's it was, uh, it down about 500 and so feet right. just a little bit short of the, the total length of the ship mm-hmm. so when it went down i read this when it went down it actually hit the bottom and the back end was still sticking up out of the lake but it mm-hmm. broke the front end of the ship right. off it's broken in half yeah yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it's thirteen hundred feet plus deep. Uh, well, it's actually thirty miles north of Marquette, where we were. Marquette's a beautiful town. Oh, it's like a cross between Sh- Old Sugar Land and maybe New Braunfels. Mm. The cross section oh, nice. of that. Uh, you, know, you walk up and down the streets. A lot of fairs and and uh, uh, street. So sugar fields, going, street things going on. Yeah. It, it yeah. Well, easy. you know, the one thing that is easy to forget, especially when you're up there at this time of the year, is January. In February. Oh, right. the good point, because you say the, the locals. Well, not a lot of people are local. It is a university town. There is a college up there, so obviously they go to school. Uh, but the folks that are running these, these tourist events, uh, they, they leave in the middle of October, and they come back in May. So in one of the boat captains that we took a cruise on, yeah, I go down to the port of Tampa, and I work that for the winter, and huh. it comes up and works. You know, it's funny because right. that's the, one of the things yeah. that we learned when we were up there. We were talking to one of the waiters. Well, what are you doing in the wintertime? Well, I'm down in Florida. Yeah, or where, Arizona Snowbird. or yeah. something like that. And so they work up north in the summertime, and then they go down to Florida in the wintertime. And, you know, I was born in Detroit, lived there 22 years, and then moved to Texas, but you never appreciate it until you're gone, and you go back there. We took my granddaughter. took Kylie there. She loved it. Uh, you know, you end the trip of the year until next year, mm-hmm. and then, of course, you save up and go to the next one. Yeah. We've already got plans for the next one. So. It, oh, yeah. Tons of Very fun. cool. Well, guess who's joined us? It's Lena Bourgeois with Equifax. And hi, Lena. How are you? Hi. Good morning. It, How's everyone doing? Well, we're just great. We're just uh, reminiscing about uh, vacations. Where are, you, where are we speaking to you from? I'm in northern Virginia, about 15 mm-hmm. miles outside of the city of D.C., and so I live in a in a old kind of farm neighborhood called Franklin Farm, and it's a great, great uh, place to raise a family. I got three kids, and um, I just uh, came back from uh, weighing in my son to play tackle football. Oh, cool! And, All right, uh, he just made it. So awesome! How old is he? Good morning. How old is He's he? Twelve. Twelve. Oh my God, the perfect age. Yeah. Yep. Well, <laughs> um, uh, are you from that area originally? I am not. I, I've been here for 18 years, so I, I believe this to be home. But I grew up in Europe, <clears throat> moved here in my mid-20s, and I lived a little bit all over the country, but uh, 18 years so far here. Well, uh, I, I, I'll tell you this, that, that that European accent is just killing me. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lena, Thanks. let's talk, let's talk uh, about Equifax. And uh, it's a, a car credit reporting agency, correct? Correct. 
Yeah. Yes. And and so you're one of what three or four of them? We are one of three. Three. Um, one of the three major CRAs, yeah. uh, credit reporting agencies, and the oldest. We're a 180 year company. We oh started the bureau business um, many years ago. We're we're based in Atlanta, Georgia. So we're a southern company, and and uh, uh, we we. Um, we, we love supporting automotive. I run the automotive business for Equifax now for the past three and a half years, but been in the automotive space for, for almost nine years now. So love, love the industry um, and, and just blown away by just the, the ingenuity and the resilience of this, this uh, economy, which is uh, such a big influence in, in, in uh, our, our world today. So, so I, I think that the, the focus of our conversation was going to be on insurance and how credit, your credit score, affects how much you pay for car insurance. But I want to I talk uh, about all of it, if we can, in the next sure. uh, 10, 15 minutes. So why, why is it important to have good credit? Well, um for many years now, and, and I, I should mention, I, when I first moved to this country, I did not realize how important credit was. But I, I, I started my, my, uh, my life here in California. And as you know, you can't get anywhere in California without a car. Correct. <laughs> so before I even got a place to live, I went to buy a car. And when I went to buy a car, um, I was looking at really nice cars, you know, from, from my mid twenties in the, you know, 15 to $20,000 a car. And I needed to finance it. I didn't have $20,000 cash sitting in my bank account. Right. So I needed to finance it. And they looked me up and they couldn't, they had to, in order to finance, they have to pull a credit report to see how are you able to meet your financial obligations? If I'm going to lend you money and take that risk, I need to see what kind of risk you are in meeting your financial obligations. And, and because I hadn't lived here before, there was really no credit history on me and I couldn't get a loan. So I had to downgrade my choice for a car. I bought a 1986 uh, Toyota Tercel. It was $8,600 cash. It was a Coca-Cola red Toyota, <laughs> two door manual windows. <laughs> you were uh, hot no baby. <laughs> yeah, no AC. <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, that really struck me, like how important it is. You cannot um, get any financing without a credit report. Right. And more importantly, in this day and age, with prices and interest rates being so what they are, having good credit uh, can really be a difference in hundreds of dollars of your payment uh, for a car, for the same price car. Okay. So it's really important. So how does that translate to car insurance? So car insurance is, is, is a little different, and I run automotive and insurance for Equifax, but there, there are obviously a lot of linkage there. When you are buying a car, you have to also buy insurance for the car. And insurers also look at, they don't look just at a credit, they look, um, they look at just you know, car history. You know, if you've had a car before, how you treated the car. Um, and so they, they look at um, a, a bigger, Part of your profile and making sure that you're also not going to be a risk, right? You're not going to go out in, in the first couple months, wreck your car, and then I have to, as an insurer, kind of cover for that. As, and you, and I haven't recouped that from you as a as a consumer. Um, insurers look at different different. We have an insurance score, so we've created scores uh, specifically for different type of of risk. So we obviously have mortgage scores, we have automotive scores, we have insurance scores, right? And so um, it's all about, you know, risk because you're, as an insurer, you're, you're looking to take on a consumer and you want to make sure, hey, this is going to be uh, a good customer for me. Profitable. Uh, I'm not going to be underwater in this relationship. You know, there, obviously there's accidents, you can't predict that. And, and they do have models that allow them to balance but they don't want to over overstretch on the risk because then they're they're not going to be able to be profitable, which is really you know why they're in business. So all of that is important. How about income and uh, being able to not only have good credit to go out and buy a let's just say a fifty thousand dollar EV today? Mm -hmm. How is that going to translate 
to my car insurance for a brand new car if I don't have good credit? So if you're, if you're um, right now, there's, so we segment consumers into different, I would say, groups. And they range from deep subprime to very, very prime. What, is that, what that does that is, mean? What does that mean, deep subprime? That, yeah. Subprime is basically in the bracket that you are for your credit score. So credit scores go from like uh, 480 to 850, right? Yeah. And right. an eight, 800 plus is super prime meaning you have had a long-standing credit history, you have paid all your financial obligations on time, you are not over-leveraged uh, with your credit, and you are an ideal, and they get the best loan terms, right? And they usually look very, you know, they are almost a no questions asked type of insurer. What are the percentages um, of people that have that ultra-high score? I mean, are they like only 20% of the population, 10%, what are they? Yeah, so there's like about five buckets, right? And they are pretty well distributed, 20% in each bucket. Interesting. Um, and so it is a, it is a, it's a broad spectrum, but we have um, invested quite a bit. You ask, you know, what does, how does income play in? So yep. we've done a, we've invested, um, Equifest has in what we call alternative data. Now credit um, is how we, ass uh, how we assess your credit score has to do with what the institution, financial institutions, report to us as your ability to meet those financial obligations. So they, they report trades, basically, on you. You have a credit card. This is your balance. This is your rolling balance. You've been able to pay. And, and that all information then, uh, uh, you know, put together in a composite score. The, 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 um, uh, the time and the length of history plays into your score that you get. The, the more history we have and the better that history is for meeting your financial obligation, the better your score is. We well, I'm 100 years old, so how much uh, history <laughs> do you need? Do you make your payments, well, Don? We, most, most lenders look at at least like five to 10 years. But what I was going to say is you have a lot of young consumers, students that are coming out, they haven't worked too much, they haven't had a chance to take out uh, many credit cards or a significant loan to show that they can pay. So they they what we call thin file or no credit consumers. And what we've done is we've actually brought in all other alternative uh, data to assess risk. So for instance, most uh, kids out there or students or young professionals have paid a cell phone for many years, right? right? Yep. And they probably maybe also paid for cable, for utilities, right? And we are now taking that, all of that information in. So lenders now have much broader sense. And what we are able to do with that data is we can actually risk assess 16% more consumers um, and get to a yes, basically get them to be able to get loans and get insurance 16% more often than they did without that information. And that's really kind of uh, transformative. Because those are the consumers, like I was when I came to this country, right? They're, they're the ones that truly need it, right? Is the people that are in the, in the lower end, the subprime and the, you know, um, deep subprime, the ones that are usually paying higher interest rates for their loans. With that data, they're now able to get better loans, better terms. They're able to actually get a loan in the first place and start building their credit, and as you build your credit, then that it gets Im improved if you do really well on those on those loans. So um, so we've done a lot to help consumers. We have a, a big mission at Equifax to help consumers live their financial best, meaning, you know, we want everybody to have access to loans, access to credits. We want them to get the best terms. And in automotive right now, because of interest rates being what they what they are, it has a huge impact in their ability to afford. Well, also and, the price of the car, yeah. and that's the. I want to talk to you about that. Yeah. How how does the price of a car figure into a credit score? I know that the better the credit score, 
chances are I can buy a more expensive car. And I think that a lot of people are doing that these days and getting upside down in payments and what the car is worth. And it just is a big ball once you get down the road three or four or five years and you go, okay, well, I'm ready to trade my car in or sell my car. Now my car isn't worth as much as it was when it was new. And now I have no equity in the car to be able to transfer that to another down payment. How does all of that play? That's a great question. So most people believe that, uh, as you know, car average car price is now around 750. And two years ago, that was under 500. <laughs> right. If you're talking about monthly payments. Monthly payments, yes. 750. Wow. Um, in the last year, there has been a huge increase in car payments over a thousand dollars. Right. I can Even see that. Yep. Wow. Yep. Yes. We have looked at that segment of consumers, and you said they're usually prime consumers because they are the ones that can afford the car in the first place. Right. So we get at least, but what we've seen is that they're not that risky, honestly, and that lenders should not, um, you know, be too too concerned about putting those consumers on their portfolio, meaning to lend to them, because these these guys, even though their payment used to be seven fifty or. 800 before they had the ability to stretch yes. to 1100 because they don't have a choice today they have to take that out and they are able to make it they're also not the ones concerned about the equity in their car they already knew going in that they probably overpaid for their car they were willing to do so they got the best terms possible to make the payment and you know what they're going to hold on to that car you know most of us don't buy a car for equity to grow equity uh, but we, what I think what's going to happen in the industry is that car prices are going to stabilize. But I don't think that their, you know, manufacturers, lenders, and dealers have, have come to, you know, get used to a certain level. And consumers have been conditioned to pay a, a, more and more you know, every year. MSRP or more. And so I think that over time it might balance. But by then, you know, this whole cycle would have come around and it wouldn't have been you know, you're not going to see consumers in cars that are th th thousands of dollars undervalued. And like, that's not going to really hurt them financially because they're going to hold on to their cars. They might hand it over to their, you know, son or daughter or, or so, you know. No, I got all of that. But here's my issue is paying yeah. for a car a thousand dollars a month for yeah. eight years. I'm sorry. I got a little problem with that. Yeah, and my question would be the, the subprime and the prime, but there's two levels of the prime because you've got a person of wealth that will go out and buy a vehicle. They know they can afford it, so they're going to go out and buy what they want. They're either going to draft it or pay cash, or if they do finance it, it's only going to be for short term, like a year, and then pay it off. So those are the advantages of the folks with wealth and the prime, but there's other folks that try to build that from the subprime up to the prime by paying their bills. Right. So you're absolutely right. Those what we've seen is the super prime, they take on the loan because, you know, they get some incentive associated with it potentially, and then they pay it off within six months to, to right. eighteen months and sure. they pay it off. Right. And, right. and and then you have subprime that are, you know, really hurting. What we've seen though is that that subprime consumer in the last year or two have been, you know, taking themselves out of market, meaning they're holding off on actually purchasing cars right now because they don't want to be stretching that far because they right. can't or they don't want to be underwater and they think cars are overpriced or the used car market is still not as healthy as it needs to be from an inventory. So they're waiting for those cars to come back into market. So unless they're absolutely forced to, they're, they've really taken themselves out of the, the market right now. Okay, I, so I, what, I, what can a yeah. consumer do to increase their uh, credit score, you know, let's say I'm a, I'm a mid 40s, early 50s consumer and I've got, you know, 15, 20 different credit cards. And as I pay them off, is it my benefit to increase my score to pay them off and close the account or just to pay them off and leave that open available credit uh, limit on that card? How does that how does that work? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. Most, we get a lot of that now because of interest rate being so high. People want to know how do I can I improve because it makes such a big impact on their, their ability to get better interest rates and, and better payments. 15 credit cards are way too much. Uh, even 10 are way too much. Even seven are too many. Uh, what you want to do is have enough, enough information, enough credit history, meaning you would have 
you know, maybe two, maybe three cars. So you can show that you can meet your financial obligations. But when you reach a certain number of credit cards, then it looks more like you're trying to split you overextend it because you're trying to sure. afford more than you, you know, buy more than you can afford. And you're kind of sh- spreading it across, you know, 10, 15 cars. And that doesn't look good on your history because what you don't want is too many open balances and too much, you know, uh, debt uh, available credit, available credit. Well, also you don't want to look like you, you know, because a, a, a lender is going to look at that and say, well, you know, he, if he has to pay off, 10 credit cards, and then I add the loan to the auto. What's going to, what's, what is going to, if anything happens, what's yeah. he going to pay for? What's he going to prioritize? Yeah. Right. Well, I have to give you a, an example. So when I was on vacation uh, a month ago, I will tell you, I lost my only credit card. So I wound up with half of my vacation with no credit card. So what I did was when I got back, I got that card replaced, and then I opened up a new card, which I have not done in years and years and years. How does something like that affect your credit score? If you only have the one and you open on another one, it's actually, it helps your credit score. Okay, good. Right? It helps your credit score as long as you pay off the card. I'll tell you. You know, paying the minimums um, are probably not the right thing to do, but paying off more or paying all of it off every month helps your credit score incredibly because that's a rolling, you know, payment that yes. you're making every month and it looks great on your on your credit file. That's good to know. So, okay, I want before we run out of time, I want to ask you, credit finance trends for EV shoppers versus engines gasoline wow. engine vehicles yes. let's question. talk about that for a second let's talk about mm-hmm. that it's a hot topic it's been a lot of conversation but they are very much the prime consumer okay these are the guys that have you know the higher end scores they're also on the higher end income and socioeconomic segment and you know that's really where we see that and they're and they're the ones buying evs today yep and it has to do a little bit not only about um you know uh them maybe being in the right you know socioeconomic but it's it's really the prices of the car evs are still more of a luxury car kind of option and that's why that kind of falls to that segment as we see evs go down market and they get into the smaller car more you know more affordable cars, yes. More affordable. You'll see more consumers, you know, um, you know, have you will see that distribution be a lot more spread. But right now, it's usually uh, seven fifty or higher in credit score, um, and you know their average payments are, are, are over a thousand dollars. And you know, you, this is more than once now that you've said seven fifty on a credit score. It seems to me that that seems to be the cutoff between subprime and prime. It is the it's it's basically a prime so eight seven fifty to eight hundred, eight hundred fifty are, are really prime consumers and then you have it goes all the way down to six forty and you're still prime it's really under six forty that you start looking at near prime subprime and then five forty and below is like deep subprime that's the roach yeah yeah that, yeah, that, yeah. That, that's bad so what do you see things uh, how do you th- see things uh, in the next year as far as credit uh, and credit scores you know what happened over the uh, after the pandemic with the stimulus the average credit score uh, went up 40 points wow that's yes. a lot so what happened is yeah and it was primarily in that subprime space they were the ones that were most of the recipients of the stimulus. And when they didn't have anything to go out and spend that money on, they basically paid off their debt. And when you pay off your debt, your credit score goes up. And so they were really coming out of the pandemic in 22, they entered the market and they were a huge, huge consumer in the auto industry. And and so now we're seeing how they play out, but that hasn't come down. It has stayed. And so if, if delinquencies hold and if, if these subprime consumers are able to manage their payments for the car, they are going to continue to move up the credit band. And so we're seeing, we're seeing a positive movement of subprime improving their, their credit scores because of, because of the, the stimulus and, and what happened after the pandemic. If I want a road to go to improve my credit, is a, a somebody or some place that I can call and get help and some guidance as to 
for instance, through Equifax and yeah. get them to help me learn and go in a certain route to improve my credit? Absolutely. I would recommend going to the CRAs. Come to Equifax's website, Equifax.com, and ask and do uh, information about my credit score. There is a full part of our website, FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions, How to Improve, a number to call to get a free credit report. Every year, a consumer is eligible for a free credit report on themselves. If they see anything that they don't know what it is or that looks uh, off and 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 they don't rec recall it's that suspicious. ever being part of their they can call an 800 number and get that investigated and, and search and to understand understanding your credit score is really really important what's happened though and i i want to call this out specifically there's a lot of other third-party organizations that offer information about your credit score and they you know all these apps yes look up your credit score yep. and stuff some of that information can be misleading. They are not credit reporting agencies. And, um, and so they are not the ones holding this information and are not regulated and supervised and governed the way we are. And so that can create a lot of confusion and misinformation with consumers. So I really recommend go to the Equifax website or any of the two, the, the three top credit bureaus we have all the information, and it is what matters. That it, is the accurate. Is, is there any item. truth to that when you get your credit checked often, that can drive the number down? Yes, there is There is that, that perception, and we, we answer this question almost the, the most frequently asked question. Like, I don't want you to pull my credit score. But here's what happens. When you're shopping for a car or you're shopping for a house, usually do that over a very short period of time. And if there is a number of credit scores within a 30 to 45 day time period, it only counts as one because we know that that is because you're shopping for the one thing, right? Okay. It's not like you're shopping for multiple. It's like it is you're in market and you're looking for a house, you're looking for a car and you have multiple dealers pulling your credit score. It doesn't hurt or negatively impact your score. It's just when that happens, month over month over month, then it, it does look a little weird. In fact, it might be fraud. And so we might flag you and say, you know, what's happening here? So, so that's something to, to manage. But if it's happening within a short period of time, like a month, it really does not impact your credit score. Lena, you have been an absolute world of uh, knowledge, <laughs> and we certainly appreciate you. You're a joy to talk to, and thanks so much. And let's check in soon, maybe within the next year, so my credit score goes down and up or whatever I need to do. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate it. And have a great morning. Thank, Thank you. You too. Yeah, absolutely wonderful interview. Okay. The In Wheel Time Car Talk Show continues right after a quick break. Everyone at the Tailpipes and Tacos Cruise in at the Loopy Tortilla Tex-Mex in Katy, thank you for participating in the best cruise in around and look forward to seeing you again. You'll hear about the next cruise in date right here on In Wheel Time. Next time you're in the West Houston Energy Corridor area, be sure and stop in at the original Loopy Tortilla Tex-Mex at I-10 and Highway 6 or the Katy location on the Grand Parkway at Kingsland Boulevard. When passing through Beaumont or College Station, stop in and have Loopy's award-winning beef fajitas and frozen margaritas. There's always a celebration at Loopy Tortilla. Loopy Tortilla founder Stan Holt and his wife Sheila are winning racers on the NHRA drag racing circuit and have a collection of hot rods and classics that everyone appreciates. Look for them at the next Tailpipes and Tacos Cruise In. The date will be announced soon and will once again be held at the Loopy Tortilla Tex-Mex on 99 and Kingsland Boulevard, just south of I-10 and Katy. We'll give you all the details right here on the In Wheel Time Car Talk show and online donations benefit god's garage we'll see you then you own a car you love but why not let gulf coast auto shield protect it houstonian john gray invites you to his state-of-the-art facility to introduce you to his specialist team of auto enthusiasts we promise you'll be impressed whether you're looking to massage your original paint to a like new appearance apply a ceramic coating install a paint protection film Nano ceramic window tent or new windshield protection called ExoShield, Gulf Coast Auto Shield is where Houston's car people go. Curbed your wheels? Instead of buying new, why not have them repaired? How about a professionally installed radar detector? Gulf Coast Auto Shield does that too. 
Get a peek inside the shop and look at the services offered by getting online and heading to GCAutoShield.com. Better yet, stop by their facility at 11275 South Sam Houston Tollway, just south of the Southwest Freeway, and get a personal tour. Gulf Coast Auto Shield is your place to go for all things exterior. Call them today, 832-930-5655 or GCAutoShield.com. That's it for this podcast episode of the In Wheel Time Car Show. I'm Don Armstrong, inviting you to join us for our live show every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and our InWheelTime.com website. Podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart Podcast, Podcast Addict, TuneIn, Pandora, and Amazon Music. Keep listening, and we'll see you soon.